Good morning, nerd fam, and welcome to Chicago. We are at KubeCon day one. I am absolutely thrilled. This is where it all began for me with the Cube. My name is Savannah Peterson, joined by three fantastic co-hosts this week. We've got Rob, we've got Dustin, and my usual right arm here, John Furrier. John, how are you feeling? We're back at our great. favorite event. Great to see you. We missed you. I've seen you since Amsterdam. It's been great. North America, KubeCon continues to be the best show in terms of developer innovation. We've been to every single KubeCon in existence, both in Europe and North America. Rob, you know this, Low key Dustin. Flex. Since the beginning, we've just, and new, new people are coming in, fresh faces are coming in, younger crowd, just the overall growth of the community at large has been phenomenal. And again, open source continues to power the innovation, and as AI hits center stage, we're going to talk a lot about that here. Uh, AI and open source, big conversation. Do you go closed, do you go proprietary, do you stay open? Uh, I've never heard that word kicked around in a show like this, but open source continues to dominate. I think it's going to be amazing. Rob, you were at this morning's opening keynote. What's, what's your vibe on what we should expect this week? Uh, well, AI, AI, more AI, and then a, <laughs> uh, a little bit on sustainability and green compute. Uh, that oh, was kind of the two big themes coming across this morning was, how are we going to do this responsibly? And I, I think part of it is if you start to look at AI, it's not exactly the greenest of technologies where you have ChatGPT using 16 ounces of water for every five prompts that it takes in. So Woo, that's, that's a data not exactly right uh, you know, the most yeah. sustainable piece of it. I think they're leaning in and trying to get more developers into some of the incubation. Uh, they talked about Kepler going into incubation, and I think those, those were the two big themes I heard uh, this morning as well. Yeah, Dustin, you're giving me a nice nod. Also, welcome back, veteran yeah. Cube alumni. We're very lucky to have you as a guest analyst. Uh, happy to be back. Uh, it's always a lot of fun. Um, yeah, on the AI uh, front, I think we were less than three minutes into the opening keynote, very Woo! first slide. Not that you were timing it. Uh, not that I was timing it. <laughs> NVIDIA, open AI, hugging face. So, you know, right out of the gate, noting that all three of those run yep. on top of Kubernetes. Um, uh, balanced a little bit with, um, I don't know, some content about you know, the, the, the power consumption of these things. Um, security and developer experience were the other sort of key pieces, key What's, themes I saw. What I find interesting, guys, is um, last KubeCon, Savannah, we were talking about AI, but they missed that talk track in, in Amsterdam. Completely. So a lot of the talks were already pre-programmed. ChatGPT launched, and then just, it's been a wave. Yesterday, OpenAI had their first developer day. I watched the Ooh, keynote yeah. as I flew in and it was very Apple-esque in the vibe. People were cheering. Um, it's a generational shift, and again, back to the comment earlier about the crowd here. Dustin, we saw at Google Next, that when the story hits AI right, it activates this community because developers love AI because it's just the productivity's big conversation, and so you bring that open AI vibe into open source where all the action is on these models. It's going to be very interesting to see how this community trans, translates into AI. I mean, this is going to be the big hallway conversation. What does AI actually do for infrastructure? And then, what are the apps going to be running on? So it's, going to be, it's a huge conversation. Well, I thought one of the most salient points made, and I don't want this to get buried, it was only a one-liner, but it came from Tim Hawken uh, when he was on stage during you know, one, of the, um, one of the panels. Uh, and he, he said that uh, it's important to note that Kubernetes was not originally designed with AI in mind. You know, Kubernetes, where it comes from, very much a web app driven you know, service hosting uh, platform. However, it has been and it is being retooled to run uh, you know, large language models, um, machine learning workloads, and, and AI in general. So I think that'll be an interesting outcome of this uh, conference, especially if you, you know, make it around some of the, the talk tracks. Uh, do we emerge with a Kubernetes that's even you know, better positioned to run yeah. the future of AI? Rob, the old I conversation, totally Kubernetes is boring, right? Yeah. It's good news, <laughs> but now you've got AI, it can't be boring with AI, but yet, what does platform engineering do with AI? Because that's the real issue. I, like, well, I what think, does it look like? I mean, I think some of, the, some of the discussion this morning was around that, was around how do you build it, and I mean, again, we kind of chuckled about architect your future being the kind of tagline again here, but it's like how do you take advantage of Intel, NVIDIA, AMD, all of the hardware there, which 
people who came out of IT into platform engineering, they kind of understand that, but they looked at it as the OS taking care of that. Now they're looking at how do we actually go straight from microservice into a GPU, for instance. And I think that's going to take some time for those organizations to build up that muscle memory to really get there. I think, they, to your point, they talked about how ChatGPT actually used Kubernetes under the hood to train the original models for ChatGPT, I think it was 3.5 or maybe even four, and they used 7,500 you know, containers to go and do that. <laughs> uh, so you start to look at the scale at which some of these things are needed, uh, that, that's where platform engineering is really going to come in. I, I think that's really exciting too. I mean, to, to you, I'm really glad you brought up that point about Kubernetes being created pre this being yep. the biggest application thereof in terms of weight of processing and, and I mean 7,500 containers is no small amount. No. We're, not, we're not joking. Do you think that this retooling moment, this transformation that we're a part of right now, is the penultimate step before we take off into an insane AI universe? Yeah. Are we just about there? Dustin, I'll start with you, you're uh, smiling. Yeah, um, <laughs> well there was, an, there was another piece uh, where Priyanka asked, uh, is this uh, Kubernetes Linux moment? You know, when Kubernetes becomes uh, you know, as universally applicable as, yeah. as a Linux? And I think that's a really salient question. I, it's probably, we're in the moment right now, it's hard to you know, examine what it looks like from, from the outside. Um, and there was another piece that I think was, I had to be reminded about. Um, I don't know who here was in uh, KubeCon in Berlin, uh, six, seven years ago, OpenAI was on stage and they showed a picture of the OpenAI team on stage talking about how yeah. they were using Kubernetes even then. So, you know, I, I'll you know, back it up a little bit and say even though Kubernetes was built to run one class of workloads, yeah. uh, it's showing quite a bit of you know, malleability into other, other domains. I think that's quite possible. I mean, that's a good point. OpenAI does have to run on something. Microsoft helped out there, but every query apparently has a cost. <laughs> and so if you right. want to run your retrieval augmentation generation, again, it's going to cost money. Yeah. But I think the enterprise conversation versus consumer is a big question. When does it get baked for the enterprise? And I think, to me, the AI conversation is not about a product. It's like, it's everywhere. It has to be everywhere in every process. And at the end of the day, here at this community, they're still caring about building and launching applications, right? So building and shipping and deploying applications has been this show. Not so much a nerd fest on infrastructure, although Kubernetes is it's there. It's definitely a room full of doers here, for sure. Well, I mean, you got, Rob and I were talking yeah. about you know, Discover, you got end users here, and you got vendors, so it's really about building and deploying apps at the end right. of the day. So if you're doing that, you got to have AI. So you can't ignore AI if you're yeah. talking about applications and scales is another po point of, hey, if I can use AI to take best practices and deploy them with automation, it's a winning hand either way, Rob. I mean, it's like, yeah. whatever is part of the stack you want to look at, it's, it's a winner. Yeah, and I, and I think also, they, they, if you roll it back even a day yesterday to what was going on here, they had a whole lot of breakouts. Like they had Backstage Con, they had Observability Con, they had a couple others here, and they were trying to bring people into those groups. And I think one of the key themes coming out of Backstage Con was the fact that it was just too hard for people to get in. And that's supposed to be the developer portal, build your own developer portal. I think there's been point. renewed interest in that, especially with HashiCorp having their challenges with their BSL licensing and what that looks like from a platform engineering perspective, but how do you make that UI really easy for people to get up and running? I was actually talking to a pharmaceutical company about this yesterday. They told me that it was too hard. It was, a, it was just too far out there that they could not get up and running on backstage. And they tried. And they said it was just too many plugins that they had to build, there wasn't everything in the community, they still have a lot of legacy. Oh, by the way, they have to be compliant with the FDA, which is not an easy <laughs> task. So are you going to really build your own or are you going to go and buy from somebody kind of thing? You just touched on something that I think is really interesting. We're at a stage where we've got a lot of emerging players in the AI space. We've obviously got a few monoliths that have been around and key technology players forever. 
your hot take, since it's a little too early to tell, I'm going to start with you, John. Do you think we're going to see some of these smaller players coming together and forming alliances and partnerships to either battle the big boys? Do you think the big boys are going to come in and gobble some of the hotter tech in the beginning? <laughs> oh, it's good. It's a loaded question. I think. I mean, me, it is. It's a build it or buy it well, dilemma for a well, whole I movement. Think, I mean, but I'm yes. Look, in this market, I think you're going to see a couple big things. The, the rich are going to get richer. The, I think the you picks, and I were talking about the that. picks and shovels are, are going to come from the cloud players. I mean, you mentioned NVIDIA on stage. You know, you got sustainability as the green theme, and hey, we're going to be go green. Meanwhile, the biggest anti-green kind of players are the hardware guys who's sucking all that, all that energy out from, with, the, with the NVIDIA cards, for instance. So that you need to have that before you can be green. So it's like the cart before the horse. So I think, NVIDIA's done well on this wave of AI. I think Amazon, Azure have dominated. Google's going to do well. Mm -hmm. Oracle's going to do well. So the IBM's rich get richer. Player. I think the little guys are going to actually punch above their weight class instantly with technology. I think the middle guys get squeezed because you got to be sucked between, do I fight the big guys at scale or, and the, the smaller people are being more productive. So I think it's going to be a reclassification of the pecking order of, of who's going to be a winner. So I would imagine smaller players call, forming Karitsus yeah. and creating opportunities to share in a, in a communal, communal vibe uh, to take territory. And I think if you're a mid-sized company, you got a challenge. Just, you got to figure out where you want to play. Yeah. If you can play in the white space of the whales, Rob. I mean, yeah. Yeah. So that's the way I see it. The rich get richer, and the smaller companies are going to grow faster and probably be more profitable. That, that's where the innovation is going to be. You know, and I'll say that coming from now, albeit back into startup mode. But I've worked at three of the world's biggest companies uh, and a handful of you know smaller growth mode startups. The innovation happens at the startups, and even you know the, the largest companies understand that. And yeah. some do get you know acquired, gobbled up. Some are uh, funded by strategic in investments. Yeah. Um, the, the VC network is quite active here. I've, I've seen yeah. multiple uh, venture capitalists uh, You've around. You've seen a lot of vests yeah. and plaid shirts. Uh, it's, it's the, Pat it's the that's, Patagonia. That's that uh, been uh, canceled. <laughs> yeah. 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 But I, I, I agree, I think also one of the thing, places to watch is who are the chairs of the different projects that are coming up, up and coming and in incubation. It was People very. People are logos. I would say logos. Yeah. So is Google in there? Is Red Hat in there? Is Canonical in there? Is SUSE in there? I think that that's going to really be the tell sign for hey, we're looking for to bring you know big. We have a big tent, yeah. but we're going to bring all of these startups in, and then we're going to pick some winners, and we're going to go gobble them up. Yeah. It's it's kind of I think we're getting to that maturity with this, where there's so many different projects, a lot of overlapping ones with competing companies kind of funding the two different competing projects. Oh, I think we're projects. seeing low key friendly war in this space. Oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And I think that'll be an interesting to see at the end of the week where that kind of plays out. Okay, so I got to ask you guys all this question. What's the hottest story you see emerging out of day one um, on stage in the presentation and the hallway track? So when I say hallway track, what's the buzz in the hallways at the parties? We were talking to a bunch of folks last night. So, What's the top story in your mind on stage that's formal, and then what's, what are people talking about in the hallways? I mean, I, I see it as Kubernetes itself has gotten to a point where it's not a science project, but I think there's a lot of science projects around it, and it's still all about how to make it easier, and how to, is AI going to be a path to making it easier? Is AI going to be a path to helping build some of these you know, with co-pilots and things of that nature, build the software to make it easier. That, I think, is an interesting tact. I've and the hearing. hallway, what's, what are people talking about? What's the scuttlebutt? It's, I, I think they're, they're seeing how is it actually embraced. I mean, if you look at today, they talked a lot about it, a lot about AI and building for AI, but they didn't talk about using AI at all. And I think that was pretty, like almost a little bit of a tell, where maybe there's some licensing issues that they're looking at and things of that nature. Yeah, I, I mean, I've seen this over the course of a number of years. I think in the early days, it, I think it was really just about, is Kubernetes going to become the standard for building, uh, deploying applications? Right. And in the early days, there was, you know, Pivotal Cloud Foundry was in the mix, you had Heroku, you had App Engine, you had, you know, all of these sort of apps as a service. 
as well as the infrastructure plays, the OpenStacks yeah. and EC2s, GCPs, and so forth. And Kubernetes, you know, came out of Google, but then sort of emerged. And I'd say the first couple of KubeCons, we were all talking about the management and deploying deployment of Kubernetes, how to do that, who to do it with, on what platforms, which Linux to choose, which partner. Um, years later, I think that's more or less a solved problem. Uh, so we're not talking about that nearly as much anymore. Uh, I think it's now much more about the workloads they're in, how to secure those, uh, definitely how to scale those, um, and how to you know, build resilient infrastructure. Once you've already got that Kubernetes there, then you can start you know, solving some much more interesting problems. So the evolution shows the progress when you talk about securing workloads, yeah. software supply chain, you kind of, that's progress. That means we're getting close to the final stage of baked. Yeah, I mean, I think, we've laid, I think we've laid, you know, the highways, you know, the highway system down on the, the landscape and now you've got interconnected cities and you can actually, you know, start building out, you know, different parts of the infrastructure. Savannah, what are you hearing in the hallways? What are you seeing here? What's your vibe on this? Well, I do want to comment quite literally in the hallways as they've opened the doors. Can you guys feel the energy in yeah, the bus? Yeah, it's just getting loud. Up behind louder, us? Yeah. I mean, just take a look. I do think this is actually an important note, not just because it's an audio shift for everyone listening, but because, you know, I mean, we, I met theCUBE at KubeCon in 2021. We were in LA. Nobody was there, quite frankly, this first event post-pandemic. There was maybe 1,300 people in the room. Then we saw it last year in Detroit. I think we had about 7,500. And we were talking this morning, 15,000 people. That's double what we had hypothetically last year. It's 5,000 more than we saw when we were in Amsterdam. So that means we're here, we're in force, we care, people are showing up, the community's all in. And I really like Priyanka, I'm going to build off of her statement, is this Kubernetes Linux moment? We've been trying to simplify container management and, and make Kubernetes easier for a long time. That's been the conversation, I feel like, at every single KubeCon. Yeah. And I think what we're going to, we're not, we're talking less about the functional application there and much more about, is this going to be the, the, the central nervous system, the spine for AI? Yeah. Is this what we're going to be using to communicate out on these roadways and things that we're doing? Yeah. Or is there going to be another tool that emerges? And I think if there's nothing that pops up, we're here. I think it's already happening right now in front of us. I think, That's, yeah. I think one of the things I want to end on this segment is, are we too close to the action being in the industry for so long? Possible. When you think about people <laughs> who are just coming in out of college, I was talking to folks last night, what's the story that's not being talked about? And I think I'll, I'll just weigh in Ooh, with my yeah. view on this, which is open source has won. It is the software industry. It's no longer open source for is sure. that thing. It's actually big vendors, big companies, developers, the DevRel, platform yep. engineering. So it is the software industry now. So open source is no longer the thing, it is the thing. You know what I'm saying? It's like, okay, so what does that mean? That means this is where things get done. And so if you're a young person coming in, what is the story of open source? I mean, Keep it open, obviously, yeah. right? Yeah. Keep well, the community I, I engaged. I mean, open source is nothing without the community of contributors. Well, I think that's, that's, so that's I the think big that's, part. Yeah. I think you're 100% on, and I think that's the interesting part, is engagement of the community, and how many, how many of these big companies are writing 95% of the code for some of these projects. Yeah. For sure. That, that to me has always been the test. Is it really a project? Okay, yeah, we contribute 65% yeah. of it, but 35% is coming from other people. That's pretty healthy. You start to yeah. get above 50% yeah. contributions, that's really healthy. I think the, when you see it and you look at 95% coming from one vendor, I start to worry, is it really open source or not? And I think that yeah. is the other side of that story. I'll yeah. jump in and take this a slightly different angle and say that I think the emergence of successful business models around open source has helped it succeed as well. And I say that as a developer, you know, having yeah. written and maintained a whole bunch of open source code, uh, but also as an entrepreneur and, and, and startup person, we were trying to raise money around an open source encrypted uh, file system and, and key manager in 2011 and 12, and we were explaining to VCs our you know, open source business model, and it just didn't necessarily resonate. We were uh, you know, up against the wall against uh, a, a number of investors, okay? Yeah. That landscape has changed tremendously, and part of yeah. open source succeeding here, I think, yeah. is that we've seen a number of successful business models enable yeah. open source to succeed. And evolution's a good thing. It's, it's a, the, the changing nature of the business model is a signal of maturization and the, the next level. And acceptance thereof, too, you know? It, it generally, yeah. 
enterprises investing in software that is open source once they understand and appreciate the business model around yeah. it. You got to make money. I mean, you got to fund it somehow. That's right. <laughs> On that note, I am so excited to see what we have to say at the end of this week compared to today, to see what other conversations we hear. If you've got a hot tip, be sure and find one of us in the hallways and give it to us. Also, if you've got some sexy swag, you know that we do a swag segment here at theCUBE. Rob, Dustin, John, thank you so much for opening the day with me. My name is Savannah Peterson. We are here in Chicago at KubeCon. You are watching theCUBE, the source for leading tech news.